Okay. All right. Yes. Okay. Yes. So um, thank you, uh, everybody, for joining. And um, today, uh, this is the second day of the category theory tutorial uh, by Stephen uh, Phillips from basics to universal constructions. And uh, uh, today, uh, we uh, had some trouble with the uh, YouTube live. So uh, we'll be uh, starting uh, with uh, just a recording on uh, Zoom and then upload it to uh, YouTube later. And uh, uh, first, uh, maybe Ariel and also Angus, if you have any questions for the yesterday's uh, component, maybe we can start from it as a part of the recap. Any I, I don't have specific questions. I just feel like I would need to go over the material and the recording again. But... Yeah, same. But uh, I think one thing which helped was, um, I forgot the name, it's uh, probably Ross asked the Ross? question about, mm. yeah. Um, when, when to know when something is like a specific instance of something versus like a general class or like, uh, yeah, whether, I think it was um, on uh, the arrows, they were like um, shorter than, like, are they the same arrow or are they different arrows? So yeah, ha having that distinction throughout would be useful, I think. Okay. Steve, are you able to hear? Yep, I got that. Um, okay, so I'll I'll do that on the on, as I go through the recap. Um, should I start? Yeah, please. Okay, so um, going back to yesterday, we're going to introduce category theory from this dual view of both geometry and algebra, and it's really the interplay between the two views of of interest here. Not, not not just one or the other. Um, and I'm just re recapping the learning objectives, you know, the three, the three basic questions, whenever you introduce category theory, people, almost the immediate response is, well, what is category theory? Uh, I introduced two of the three view, three possible views. One is a theory of structure. And what I meant by that, is that in category theory view of the world tends to regard um, structure, everything in terms of arrows. So arrow here. And, and yesterday I showed how you can regard say, an algebraic structure like a monoid or even a category itself as a kind of complicated arrow, an arrow that's composed of actually other arrows. And then from there, the notion of, that's the notion of structure, that is the basis for a category theory approach. And then I also said that Category theory can also be regarded as a theory of formal analogy. And in that case, um, <clears throat> analogies are really just, if your basic objects are arrows, then your analogy is really a map between these arrows. And this looks very similar to what's called in cognitive psychology, what's called structure mapping theory by this. Where now to get back to that, the initial question the difference between levels, um, sometimes you can talk about the individual points as being an object, or sometimes you can objectify these and regard the entire arrow as an object. So, and that's what we did yesterday. And the reason for doing that is that the, the passage from talking about a category to talking about functors is really, it becomes quite natural as just, a, just another kind of arrow. So, it, it's, so you can have arrows at one level and you can have arrows between arrows at another level. And this is really just a generalization of what's familiar in computer science where we talk about functions and functions of functions, by a function that returns not just a number, but say another function. So that's, that's the basic distinction. And category theory makes this distinction very clear. But the critical thing is that there is no, critical thing, thing that I appreciate is that there's no sort of fundamental le level. The level of what, what you treat as an object or a category really depends on what sort of question you want to ask. So for example, um, an object could be just a point. Uh, and then your arrow, then a map between those points is an arrow at one level, or you could choose to regard the entire arrow, you know, capture that entire arrow as a as an object in itself, and then talk about an arrow between those arrows. And so, an object could be 
just like a number, a letter, a, a set, or it could be in a, a category in its own way. Not every structure is a category, but more often than not, you can. And we'll see, I'll, 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 come, I'll introduce an example of this soon. But more often than not, the collection of such structures itself forms a category, even if the structure itself is not a category. Okay, um, and then what we're going to focus on today is this third aspect, the notion of a universal mapping property or a universal property. Think of a universal property as something that's, it, for a psychologist, it's probably the closest analogy is something like a, a relational a schema of some type, where you have a bunch of situations and they all have some common structure. Uh, <clears throat> the common structure is somewhat analog analogous to a universal property. Uh, what, what we should say in category theory, how you define, how do you determine those sort of universal structures is by their, what's called their universal mapping property. And this is formally defined. Uh, yesterday, I also introduced, uh, the second question was why is category in, in, important and important in the cognitive science? And my, one explanation I said was as a lingua franca. And the theme, the sort of unifying theme to, re, to highlight this uh, perspective is the notion of a, a commutative square, uh, giving a sort of a geometrical perspective on the sort of unifying link between all these concepts I introduced. Now today I will sort of, well, it may or may not, but the other important point is as a theory, as a scientific theory, we want, to, we want our scientific theories to be such that what we predict uh, come from the core assumptions of the theory, not the so-called ad hoc assumptions, not just things that you arbitrarily add into a theory, just to die. And you get a category theory pathway via this notion. And then this leads to a general principle for doing answer to answer the how of category theory. That leads to a general principle called the universal mapping principle for thinking about uh, cognition and doing cognitive science in terms of these universal, of these universal constructions. Hey, Steve. Yep. So I, I was actually thinking after yesterday's talk, uh, maybe you know the kind of the examples uh, or situation which uh, is familiar to at least, you know, our us in our lab laboratory or quarter structure mm -hmm. is that uh, starting from somewhere here as a color similarity matrix, like a mm -hmm. quarter structure appearance relationship structure. Yep. And then from, from person A in, let's say, you know, who speaks English to somebody who speaks Japanese, mm -hmm. um, let's say, a as in Jap uh, America and the J as in um, Japanese or something like that. And then this one is a translation into the, uh, like a linguistic, you know, uh, naming of the color. Mm -hmm. Something like that can be the situation of uh, this uh, commutative square, mm -hmm. right? So the appearance, uh, based on the appearance structure, we can make, um, uh, uh, linguistic report, and then that can be translated into another language, or somebody's, you know, um, appearance structure can be translated into somebody's potentially, and then to translate it into that person's language. Yes, um, that's one possibility. Probably this situation is getting more into uh, a, a more general form of universal construction called an adjunction, I suspect. But, Maybe. Yeah. Um, what we'll see in the adjunction is not this, this square, but uh, a line through here, trying. And so the translation, sorry, the map from here across to here uh, will be mediated by this uh, common point here. Uh, one way to think of this is like a cluster, I suppose, and this is sort of the prototypical. So this here might be the prototypical example of your of your situation, and all the others sort of hang off this in relationship to this. Um, that's a little bit abstract explanation on my part, but uh, yeah, and I'll, maybe one one thing I shouldn't probably also uh, I should uh, clarify is that here I was assuming that maybe this you know quadrilateral structure itself. Mm -hmm is uh, more or less the same between these, you know, people who are speaking a different language. Yeah. So that, that corresponds to this, you know, cone like structure that you're going to talk today. Yeah. If that is the case. That's a possibility. Then, yeah. All right. Okay. Please go ahead. Yeah, I probably should have introduced examples closer to the 
probably a structure. Okay, so I, I kind of do this, but in a sort of abstract, indirect way still. Yeah, it's a good question. I'll try. Oh, that was just the thing. Oh, and the, okay, the linking concept, okay, the uh, square of relations is what links geometric groups. Okay, uh, skip all this. I just want to make, ah, oh, this, and this was the overview of yesterday's, the top half of this is overview of yesterday's concepts I introduced. And the recurring theme there was this notion of level of dimensionality. So we have, we have structure both within and between categories and there's, there's a commonality between here. So within a category, we talk about objects, arrows and composition. And there's this notion of object as a point, arrow as a, as a map between points, map between objects and compositions and map between arrows. So there's a natural sort of dimensionality in this. And I also wanted to stress that the point, although we say an object is a point, as I alluded to at the beginning of the introduction, you know, what you treat as an object or what you treat as a category really depends on the question at hand. So the point itself could have some internal structure. And this is particularly in the case where you're looking at the level of between categories. Again, a category would regard as a point, but this, this big black dot here, uh, you know, we could, could be hiding a, a substantial amount of uh, internal structure as well. And then the funk is uh, mapped between these points, preserving that structure. I mean, natural transformations map between funk is. Uh, <clears throat> and the, the representation of a natural transformation, sometimes it's a double arrow, an arrow with a dot above it, to signify that it's a different kind of arrow to the, to the functor. And again, this link gets back to the earlier question too, the, this difference between levels. So as I said at the beginning, although the a base level need not be absolute. The levels between, uh, once that base level is specified, you know, the levels between are very clearly uh, picked out. And so the natural transformation as you know, indicated by the symbol is a different type than the function, even though they're both, even though they're both are called morphisms in their respective context, context. Now this brings up a, another very important point about category theory and all, all the constructions and something that's probably trips up a lot of people, particularly in cognitive science and particularly in um, psychology, uh, is the context in which you talk about these things is crucial. So for example, <clears throat> you'll often read, and what often is confusing to people is that you'll often read that, I, I pointed out, you know, we have like arrows uh, within a category, we have these functors, which are arrows between categories, and we have these other natural transformations, which are between functors. But you also read that all of these are examples of morphisms or arrows. So it, it, you might start to wonder, well, what's the difference? Well, the difference is that they're all arrows, but in different contexts. So for example, this arrow up above here, or this arrow here is in, in the context of a particular category C. But this arrow here is in the context of a category of categories. So it's in a larger context. It's actually uh, a very typical example is called cat, a category of small categories. Uh, the reason why they call it small categories is to avoid the um, paradox of like, like you have in set theory, set of all sets. So when, my, when they say small, they mean small in a technical sense, not a small, as in a small number of objects. Uh, uh, I won't really get into this issue, but it's important. But And then finally, so, you know, this is a, an arrow or a morphism. This is an arrow or a morphism. Uh, and this one here is also an, an arrow or a morphism. It's, it's, uh, it's in a, yet another context uh, and called, what's called the functor category. Uh, and I, I won't talk a whole lot about this. Well, it'll come up when I talk about limits, but I won't, I won't talk about it much at this point. But, but usually denoted by it's a category of all the functors from a category C to category D. The, point, the, the simple point I want to make here is that um, all this confusion about, well, what do you mean? What level are you talking about? Is clarified or specified by, by, it's clarified by specifying the category within which the construction takes place. Now, often you'll read in, a, in an introduction, sort of more, uh, say, an introduction to category theory written by, say, mathematicians. Um, they'll, they'll just uh, elide this thing, just rely on you to uh, pick up the context by yourself. You know, by, for example, if we're talking about sets and functions, well, it's probably the category of set that I introduced yesterday. Talking about functors, well, some sort of functor category and so on and so forth. Uh, and so it's this information here, this context is really crucial that distinguishes you know, what, in what sense are you, are you referring to this as an object or a category or a functor and so forth. 
Now, why it's problematic in cognitive science, in, particularly in psychology, is often the context is not really crucial to what people tend to focus on the, on the, on the thing of interest and leave the context unspecified. And so either by default, there's some sort of universal, sort of one level of context, in which case, if there were such a thing in category, all these sorts of distinguished notions would start to collapse and become rather um, circular. There's this notion of context, i.e. what category you're actually talking about, what category you're actually working in, uh, that, makes, that keeps these distinctions separate. So that's crucial. Now, a point, now, a point that leads on from this is that the, the, the focus of today's talk is this notion of universal construction. And, and again, I've given this sort of mysterious uh, box with an arrow in it to highlight the sort of geometrical nature. Of it. it looks very similar to the, the notion of a natural transformation highlighted here. And the difference being whether natural transformation focuses on sliding from left to right, from the left vertical edge to the right vertical edge, where the universal construction is regarded as the sliding from the top, the top horizontal edge to the bottom. Now, from that perspective, the, the difference seems rather trivial. It's just a rotation of the box. But this emphasizes the other general point that I want to, want to make, wanted to make. And that is, it's not just the geometrical perspective that's important. It's the, how the geometrical perspective relates to the algebraic perspective. It's not, and so it's not just any square, it's the typing of the square that's also crucial. And so we say the basic concepts that sort of unify or get linked by this notion of type square, not just any square. It's this interplay, interplay between geometry and algebra that's quite crucial and quite interesting. And so when we go from here, as we make the conceptual leap from uh, natural transformation to uh, universal construction, which we almost got to yesterday, leader. It's not just the shape, <clears throat> a slight rot rotate, mental rotation of this um, shape, it's also the typing of the under the square itself is also changing. So, now, once we get to there, then there, there are many kinds of universal constructions. I'll talk about uh, two basic ones, two very important ones. One is the notion of general uh, universal morphism, and has this sort of triangular icon, triangle icon here. And we noted yesterday that triangles can be regarded as special squares, pointed squares. And then the notion of limits of progress, a very important class of universal construction. Uh, and this, this all comes under the, the topic of, of structural relationships between various um, bits and pieces. And then we also want to talk about um, some sort of notion of computation. And one extension of this idea, another kind of universal construction, is the notion of recursion as a catamorphism and, it's, and the dual notion of co recursion, it's a serious concept of co recursion. Most people have heard of recursion, but probably not aware of the notion of co-recursion or the categorical dual animal. Whether, whether or not we get to all the details of this is probably unlikely within, within one hour, but uh, this outline sort of shows that all of these concepts are quite closely related. Again, this notion of square pops up in the notion of co-recursion as a sort of traversal of the square from in, in sort of this direction uh, for the Catamorphism and then sort of the traversal of the opposite direction for the animal. And that's how these link these all these various concepts are linked uh, conceptually. Okay. Steve, could I ask a quick, I hope, clarifying question? Sure. Uh, you were talking uh, in the top segment of that slide about the, the different contexts and that the arrow. Mm -hmm. uh, is being applied to, to different things in, in different contexts. Yeah. Uh, so uh, are you saying that from a strictly category theoretic point of view, uh, that you know, if you're only concerned about formal shuffling of symbols according to the rules of category theory, uh, that you know, category theory doesn't care what it's applied to, uh, we, can apply, we can apply it to different types of objects and, and arrows and so on. And we, we give those different names, uh, you know, morphisms and functors and, and, and uh, natural transformations, um, just as a convenience to tell us what, or what we're operating on. But from the category theoretic point of view, category theory itself doesn't care what it's applied to those names about, yeah, but from a category theoretic point of view, there's not actually any difference between a natural transformation and a functor. Uh... Yeah, it's a good question, uh, and it's no. There, there are there are differences. Uh, okay. Um, and the crucial thing about category theory and why it's so interesting is that the difference between identity, uh, 
the sameness up to identity and sameness up to equivalence. So there is an equivalence between these two functor and natural transformation, i.e. Yeah. morphisms between some kind of cat, uh, category, but they're not identical. Uh, specifically, uh, once you define, once you specify what level you're talking about, uh, the natural transformation is always one level higher than a functor, regardless of whatever level you're particularly talking about. Okay. Good question. Uh, uh, and yeah. So, and that's yes. the, the, the distinctions, it stops everything from being circular. Yeah, okay. That's why they had this. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then yesterday, just to get, and yesterday I showed you this picture of um, three basic concepts, category function and natural transformation, how they all hang together. And sometimes it's good to have the whole picture in one place so you can see the relationships between all the concepts. But typically, what, uh, you'll focus on just on one aspect of it. For example, if someone, if you should, if someone uh, showed you a natural transformation to be, it only show you a square because this, because the square resides in a different, because the square is really where all the action is happening uh, in the, uh, it resides in the codomain of the two functors. But uh, it's also, hand, but you would also like to know where do they come from, where they come from, uh, you know, this original category here, and the image of the original category, of the bits and pieces in the original category by the, the two functors. And you'll notice that I've driven, Two different types of uh, arrows here and that gets back to the point that there's two different things happening here these arrows the solid arrows are, are arrows within a particular category so this is this arrow here is in, in the original domain category and these four arrows here reside in the uh, or reside in the codomain category so for a natural transformation it makes sense it has to be you know, you know, we're, we're comparing within we're not comparing apples with oranges we're comparing apples with apples in, in a sense now, the dotted arrows here are, are different kinds of arrows. And, and in fact, I, I mentioned it yesterday briefly that when some of these objects have um, internal structure, you distinguish between the map between the object and the map between the things inside the object, right? Usually it's set the other thing called, as a map, sorry, as a maps to object arrow. And this dotted arrow is really a replacement for maps to, but I didn't want to introduce that point. Because what's happening is the functor is actually is a map between the Category. So this category is now an object, and inside this category are objects and morphisms. And so these dotted arrows are just map, telling you what the action is on the object and what the morphism. That's the reason for having the two different notations for arrows. And again, it, it helps to keep these two these different levels distinct but related. Uh, and then I should briefly mention that um, because again, this gets back to the earlier point. Um, <clears throat> arrows, functors, and natural transformations are all morphisms of some kind. And so they all, as morphisms, all morphisms compose. But in this notion of dimensionality of composition, so we have composition in, in the horizontal dimension that's within a category, composition in, sorry, composition in the vertical dimension, i.e., uh, within a category. Uh, again, it, it, this is the notion of they're all the same sort of a, from a geometrical perspective, they all look very similar, but it, the typing is different. That's, and I'm expressing this typing by the different uh, dimensions. Okay. And then we have composition of the natural transformations shown here in the horizontal dimension. And we also have composition of the, of the functors, but it's not shown here in the outer plane dimension. But I just briefly. Yeah, recap stuff. Okay, and then these next two slides were really leading up to today's talk, this notion of um, universal morphism. So there's this, this special case where one of the edges is actually just the identity arrow, uh, in this case here, in which case, uh, because we know that every object is associated with an identity arrow, we, can, we really don't need to show the, two, the, the same object twice, and we can really show it as a single object and with the identity arrow omitted, elided because we know that it's there by the rules of category. In this case, we, have, we go from having a commutative square to a commutative triangle. This commutative triangle's formation here is really the component, important component of this notion of universal mapping property or universal. I, I use the term in several different ways. They're not really 
uh, synonymous, but they, they all point to the same. And this is where that's the sort of lead off to today. And then the second slide also alluding to today's talk was this notion of uh, another notion of community square introduced yesterday, uh, where one of the more where one of the arrows is a isomorphism, that is, it's invertible. And in particular, more, or more, more importantly, it's not just that it's any isomorphism. Um, in, in this situation, if you have an isomorphism where you can go from here to here to here as, an, as a detour, say, for example, you wanted to go to the shop, and the shop, and you, your home is at A, and you want to go to the shop is at B. But on, on weekdays, the, on weekends, the, this road is, is closed, and you're not permitted to travel down this road, well, you, you can take a detour. It's basically the idea of this sort of arrangement. Now, this is just one simple case, but in a very important general situation, uh, not only is this arrow an isomorphism, but it's a special kind of uh, isomorphism. It's called the initial. In this context, it's called the initial algebra or a category of algebras, uh, which I'll come to. And, and in doing this, this provides the basis for recursion where you, what you really want to do is go from A to B, like we did the hit, going, going from home to the shop. But you can't do that directly because the, the, this A has lots of, is, is a complex object built up of other objects. And so you need to pull it apart first. And, and what you do is pull it apart. You go backwards along this uh, initial algebra. And you keep going backwards until you get to the terminating condition, which is right up here. And so you no longer need to go from A to B. You just go straight through here. This is the terminating condition. And once you do that, uh, then you can sort of um, go back along this way. And that's, that's the recursive notion. So each of these squares is repeated, it happened before. Okay. And that's, that's the sort of lead up to today's talk about universal, universals. Now, before I get to there, I just wanted to talk about one other point that someone raised. Or maybe I raised it. Ah, and and so we, we saw yesterday, I said that a category theory, a theory of structure, we saw this yesterday, the notion of monoid uh, re-expressed instead of monoid being a set plus some binary operation and some special element called the unit. Uh, we re-expressed the monoid as a set of two functions, the multiplication function and the unit function, the not a real unit function, which picks out the unit. And in doing that, uh, we can see we can re-express it as two arrows or just a single arrow. And this is this notion of, uh, of um, structure, the structure of a monoid now being re-expressed as a single arrow. And then once you do that, then the, the step from monoid to monoid homomorphism is really straightforward. It's just a map of this arrow by second, uh, sort of second order arrow into another monoid homomorphism. And the, the reason for doing that is mon monoids are miniature categories, one object categories. And so you, when you do it for that monoid, you can see you can do it also for uh, categories themselves. Uh, and that was the, and that was the point of this slide here. It's a bit more complicated because categories have a little bit more structure than uh, monoids. You can think of a category as a generalized monoid in the sense that categories can have multiple objects or doing something something similar. Uh, it, ha it has more arrows to, when you want to express the structure, and but still you can express it as a single arrow. And once you do that, uh, then you're pretty close to um, expressing it uh, the functor. And that was the point of doing it. Okay, normally, in this way. Re express. Yep. Yeah, it's been uh, roughly like um, 25 minutes. Uh, so, cool. yeah. Um, shall we take a break and then uh, restart in four minutes? Oh, can I do a, like a one minute intro to? Yeah, that's fine. The yeah. Prime, uh, as a sort of priming for the. Uh, and so we're very, we we're very close to the notion of uh, universal morphism. And saw it very quickly, sort of a miniature example of that there. And here is the definition of, oh, okay, and the motivation for me to, what is a universal morphism? Okay, so that, well, a universal mapping property is some property that is composed of two things, sort of a common, a common thing. Okay, and I'll leave it at this slide, I'll leave and we'll go for a break. But I just wanted to leave you with this point here, give you a sort of a, a universal property is one that is, is, can be expressed as a common, in terms of a common map, this is called it's called mediating map or called universal, and a unique map. The common map specifies 
well, it's a common matter, a whole bunch of incidents in some given context. And the unique map picks out the individual incidents within, within that group. Uh, and then that leads, and that's the notion of universal morphism. And a limit or a perimeter is a special, very important special case in this problem. So how, okay, so that's the sort of lead in, and then let's go for a break. <laughs> okay, good. We'll muse about it during the break. Oh, um, yeah. Uh, maybe you can sh uh, keep on sharing the slide because it's okay. uh, it's an uh, important slide, right? Yeah. I I just uh, measure the time. So the uh, analogy is, you know, ask uh, Steve whether this kind of, you know, analogy is a uh, correct one to make or not. Yeah. But, you know, you, you guys can probably also say, you know, the impression to him, uh, because with that, you know, it's also good feedback to uh, Steve. Okay, Steve, we're just talking about how it's like for people without a formal mathematics background, your slides are good, they're very clear, but it's just, it's still hard to go through. And it feels like we're trying to cover like, 
a semester or several semesters worth of maths in a short space of time. Um, yes. Particularly without like getting my hands dirty with some of the like questions and like trying to do questions and answers. I'm not sure I'm always fully like that I could manipulate the, the information, even though this this is, gives me a good sense of like what category theory is overall and what the ideas are and that sort of thing. Yep. But I, I don't think that's, I just want to clarify, like I've tried having a go at Daniel Spivak's book, for example. Oh um, yeah. And like, that was also hard going for me. Yep. So like, I think it's just the material rather than your presentation. <laughs> Yeah, so at the end of the last slide, gives, I give uh, a list of some introductory textbooks. Probably the best one in that sense uh, are the first two. Uh, since we have a bit of time, I'll pop it up now, actually. Right, right now, there Yeah, this. I, think I found. Um, well, this, this one, uh, uh, this book here, is very, very conceptual, very basic. But this one is a little bit more, but not technical, not so technical. Yeah, yeah, so, um, it's, uh, it's, uh, it has a conversation between the teacher and the student and lots of exercise, right? Yeah. Okay, cool. But you probably, after you go through that one, you, the next one I would recommend is Simmons. The reason for that is he takes it from a, categories from a ordered sets point of view, where in that situation, there is only at most one morphism, one arrow between objects. So it cuts down the sort of con the cognitive load on what you've got to think about. So I found it to be quite good as well. Okay. Thanks. Okay, please go ahead. Okay. So I let, we left off with this um, the formal notion of Universal morphism, and in the break, I also underlined uh, this thing here. Well, what I want to clarify is, usually in a sort of informal context, when people say universal, they, they seem to mean over everything. And again, this gets back, gets back to the earlier point: the distinction between having a single universe and, in category theory, uh, a single context, and where in, whereas in category theory, each category is a kind of context. So it's always a universal with respect to a particular context, with respect to a particular category, and actually with respect to a particular function, as we'll see. So it's not universal over everything, but everything within that context. That, that's important. Here's the formal definition. Um, there are actually two forms of universal morphism, the primal form and the dual form. The dual form is just obtained by reversing all the arrows in the primal form, but let's just go through the... the now, Already you see this triangle popping up. It looks very similar to the, the special case of the natural transformation that I mentioned earlier. But there are some important differences. And again, this gets back to the issue of typing. What, what, what we're really saying, and perhaps maybe the concrete example we'll introduce very soon would clarify what's going on here. But the key point to note here is that um, when we talk, what we're saying is that a universal morphism is from an object X to a functor. Now, already this sort of introduces a sort of conceptual difficulty. Normally, we, when we say morphism, the way I've introduced it and the way it's normally introduced is it's usually between two objects. So immediately you have this sort of conceptual disconnect in that we're talking about a relationship between an object and a functor. So we've got to get over that hill first. And, and, and it's a pair of things as well. It's not just a single arrow where one, one when the left hand. Uh, component is an object and the right-hand component is an, is an arrow. So that's another conceptual difficulty. Um, and the, but the critical issue is that it, this commuting triangle here and, and this so-called, what's called a unique uh, existence con uh, condition. And what it's really saying is that um, the, the functor is actually, we have this category here. Well, it's, uh, let's, well, in this context, I'm calling it A. And we have this functor that's sending all the bits and pieces in A to the bits and pieces in B. That's this thing here. B. So what, what the universal morphism is, is it's a relationship between X and this functor so, uh, and such that 
and there we pick a, a sort of like think of it conceptually as like the closest point you can get to x from an object a in in the original category okay so all these object scenarios get mapped into here and what the universal morphism is saying is that there's a particular object here a which is the closest you can get to x via f f is our function now it's closest in a general sense not in necessarily in a literal sense but and the, the closeness is this arrow here and the very next example in the very next slide i'll say in the, how to make this more concrete and that's the basis of and so that's why the universal morphism is this a and this arrow here <laughs> I, I should give it it's better to give an example immediately to make this concrete <laughs> and this <clears throat> this example relates to the one i gave yesterday about the ceiling yesterday i talked about the ceiling function both as a functor and as a natural transformation. Now I'm going to give it yet another perspective on the ceiling function as a, in terms of a universal morphism. So what we see here, <clears throat> it, uh, recall that the ceiling uh, function, as you know, in um, ordinary mathematics, is just a map that sends all the, the a real number like 2.1 to its uh, closest integer, not smaller than itself. So in this case, it's three. So that's just a ceiling function, okay? very simple function. And how to express this as a universal morphism? Well, it's a universal morphism from, here's our target here. We want to get to, our target is 2.1. And we have a whole bunch of um, numbers over here. Actually, this is the category. Of integers. And we have this, uh, what's called an inclusion function. What we want to do is include all these integers into the category of reals. And so the uh, universal, what the universal morphism is, is the closest you can get to this number here from here. What's the closest integer? Well, the closest integer is three. Well, that's, what's that saying? What it says is that for any other integer, um, you, any other integer, to get from, to get to 2.1 from any other integer, you must go through uh, three. That's what this triangle is saying here. And in this sense, it literally, the universal morphism in this context, it literally is the closest number that you can get to 2.1. Okay. The closest in the sense that this is the, this lesser than or equal to arrow uh, is the only arrow, uh, is the arrow that uh, you must go through for every number. And so there are two, there are two perspectives, here, actually. And this, and this is the reason why the, the uh, universal morphism is actually expressed as a pair. Okay. So it has two components. This component here, which comes from the original category, this is one here. Okay. And you can think of these here. Remember, I said that yesterday I said that we were interpreting uh, functors as a kind of representation or an image. The image and what's happening here is the image of this is the closest you can get to here a via of this uh, component here. And I, I also said yesterday that the, one of the confusions is that category theorists often denote these with the same symbol, but in reality, these are three different arrows. Okay? All, they all have a common type. They're all a order arrow, but this is the arrow between this one and this one. This is a different arrow between here and some general uh, number here. Okay? It's composed of this arrow here. In fact, this is just a transitivity property. It say, says that um, uh, three greater than or equal to uh, 2.1 and y greater than or equal to 2.3 means that y greater than or equal to 2. Okay, and that's why it has these two components. So it's, it has a both a, the closest number, which is three, to 2.1 and its relationship. It's like the missing piece, the gap. 
if you draw it, it's more concept, more in terms of as a, visually. But what the functor do is is doing is projecting this the domain to its image. And this is really our target here, and what it's saying is, well, this is well, let's let's say our targets here actually. What it's saying, this is the closest point we can get. This point here to our target. We start here and we take a jump via F to here. Well, this is the closest point. Every other point here must go through this one. And so, and this, so this is technically called, this is called the mediate, this is called the, um, also called the universal object in the, of this um, construction. And this is called the mediating arrow. It's not really called the universal arrow because it's, Gets confused with the concept of universal morphism, so they call it the mediating. It's called mediating because every arrow here must factor through here. And we said there are. It, it might be a good time to, if you want questions. Maybe a good time now, but uh, qu very quickly, we said there are two forms: a uh, primal form and a dual form. Well, the natural dual of ceiling is floor. The floor just takes every uh, real number to the, the largest energy, not greater than itself. So in this case. Uh, the floor of 4.9 is uh, 4. But it happens in exactly the same way, in an analogous way, except the arrows are all reversed. And so uh, in, in this case, the uh, inclusion functor is going in this direction. Okay. And in this case, our target is sending, all, sending everything in here to the image in here. And our target in this case is actually the number 4. And we're, we're trying to get as close as possible here from any number in here. That's a, that's a very simple example. Of, uh... Steve, Steve? Yep. Um, I think uh, probably the other form is uh, kind of uh, okay once we understand a primal, a primal form, but uh, some, some of the confusion or um, unclear thing to uh, novice is that uh, wh why do we need to have, for example, you know, Y here? Uh, why? Okay. Um, so it's because I, I I didn't specify I didn't fully explain the definition of a universal morphism. And so what it says is that uh, a universal morphism from this object to this functor uh, is a pair consisting of, of of an object A. We want an object A such that, and now the Y is for every other object in this category and every other morphism here, um, there exists a morphism here such that this one is composed of these two. And this is the reason why it, gets, it starts to get really confusing is because we're introducing a whole bunch of terms at the same time, but it's a, it's a condition over all of these objects in this category here and all of the morphisms in this category here. Uh, that's why we introduced the general notion of why. It's not just any why, it's a whole bunch of whys. And it's not just any arrow here. It's a whole bunch of errors. Uh, so I have to go back to the uh, previous slide. Uh, I didn't, in, this, in the actual definition, I didn't spell this out. Uh, and so what it's saying is that universal morphism from X to this functor is a pair um, uh, A alpha making the functor. That is, it satisfies. It, the crucial answer to your question is this what's called the unique existence condition. And what that says is that um, it's only a universal morphism if the following two things hold. One, um, that for every object Y in your uh, domain category here, the domain of the functor that you're interested in here, and given that Y for every morphism from your target X to the image of Y, F of Y, that's this morphism here, G, uh, for every such thing, um, that all, all these morphisms uh, factor through or, or are composed of this alpha, this one alpha, and this unique morph, uh, sorry, uh, uh, and there exists a unique morphism here, such that it's composed here. So a couple of things are going on at the same time. This is what makes it, understanding the universal morphism a little bit difficult. Uh, and that's why working in the context, context of say order sets, it simplifies this a bit, because in the, in the context of order sets, this literally is, uh, this universal morphism is literally the closest you can get to the target. But in a more general context, it's, 
um, you know, this could be quite a, a other, and we'll see in a, in a few slides uh, the other kinds of things. It's quite a general situation, uh, but that's that's the reason. It's because of this uh, this unique existence condition, uh, specified, which I haven't uh, detailed, but uh, I'm just giving it here. Mm. The, key yeah, so, point, mm. the key point is that this arrow exists. And it's unique, and that's the reason for the dot. The dotted line here, it says it's not just any arrow; it's, it's the arrow that makes this uh, commutativity condition. Uh, so it's a unique arrow that satisfies this commutativity condition. And yeah. So, previous a couple of things that is probably confusing or difficult is, uh, as you said, uh, this mor morphism is already. A bit different from, uh, or we need to expand our mind so that uh, this uh, uh, this also talks about this object in B two functor here, right? That's right. Yeah, that's where so that, uh, RO or morphism between object to object or functor to functor, but it's an object to functor. That's yep. one thing. And also, this one morphism is a pair. Yes, that's right. In the context of universal morphism, it's a pair. And the pair of this object in A and arrow in here. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So that's a kind of weird thing. Yeah. <laughs> and and what I want to do in about three or four slides time is to so what I'm saying here is we need to make this leap of faith from natural transformation to universal morphism. We'll go we'll sort of go around this concept of universal morphism, and then later on I'm going to bridge this gap between uh, natural transformation and universal morphism by this concept, this more general concept of what's called the comma category. And so I'm sort of breaking this, the continuity a bit in this sense, but I want to bridge that break in a few slides time. Mm. Uh, so my, my understanding, you know, if, if I don't know whether it helps or not, but uh, to you guys, so, you know, it's really weird to think about this an you know, object to functor as an uh, morphism, yeah. right? Yeah. But uh, because we are talking about a pair of object here in category A, which maps to you know this object through this functor. Yeah. And then arrow here yeah. maps from the origin of this you know, object into this guy. If you think about this morphism from object to functor, and also you know combination of this pair of object in A and uh, arrow in B, then it holds. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. So maybe just like a clarify, but like this universal morphism, is it? Can we still consider it as like a morphism? Then it's an arrow of some sort. Or is it just completely different to that? Um, it needs to be thought in a couple of different ways. Okay. And the short answer is no. It's a little bit more general than the ordinary morphism that we uh, that I introduced. Okay. Maybe the term terminology is a bit unfortunate, but uh, we'll see as we get into the notion of comma category how this links back to the. Actually, it links back to your original question about notion of level, how we, we can map, we can, sometimes we talk about an object as it being an arrow itself. Uh, and so this is kind of like the situation where it's an object in one, at one perspective, but it's also consists of an arrow and another object at another perspective. This is potentially one of the most confusing aspects of category theory is because we flip between different perspectives. But what makes it this all non, uh, non-trivial is that there's a way, even though we flip between these perspectives, we still maintain the relation, their relationship. So we, uh, uh, which allows us to do that in a sort of non-arbitrary way. Steve, uh, is it correct to consider this as a sort of the critical uh, sort of the tool in category theory, where yeah. you start with uh, kind of your separating levels of uh, concepts, and then because of this universal morphism, you can go between these levels. Yes, that's one way of thinking about it. Yeah, there's a natural way or a universal way of going. A good example of that is, in fact, if I can go back to an earlier example, 
to, to answer your question, uh, if you go back just a little bit further, at the risk of disrupting, uh, well, this is, this is the point, one of the points here, we, we're, at one level we're talking about arrows, but we can objectify the arrows as objects. Okay. And we can do this, in a, and we can go back as well, but we can do this in a, in a, a natural universal way. And a, a specific common example of this is illustrated here. Or we'll, I'll illustrate here. Um, notice that you might wonder why, what's the difference between category theory and graph theory? Well, if you look at a graph, the graph is also very similar to a category, but it's not quite a category. A graph, you would also have um, a set of vertices. Uh, sorry, a set of, consists of a set of edges and a set of vertices analogous to the set of objects and set of um, and two arrows, a source arrow, uh, sorry, uh, two maps, uh, what's, what's called a source and a target map. And all that does is directly analogous to the domain and codomain map. All, it say, all, all these two maps do is to tell you, given any edge of a graph, tell you what is the source vert vertex of that edge and what is the target vertex of that edge. And you can do, and very simply, you can do um, graph homomorphisms. Once you, once you give that sort of arrows perspective on graphs, then the notion of graph homomorphism is directly analogous to the notion of a functor or a category homomorphism in that it does the same kind of thing. There are two kinds of maps, a map of um, edges and a map of vertices, and a graph homomorphism respects the source domain relationship between all the vertices, directly analogous to this situation here. And so <clears throat> this is a graph, and the graphs are also expressed um, as, you know, Analogously, um, set of vertices G zero by analogy to um, a set of edges G one, and then your um, two uh, maps uh, S and T, which tell you how these two sets relate. And this is very similar to what we saw in the definition of a category. Okay, back about. Uh, right here, okay. very similar. But notice this, there is a difference. So here, here we have our uh, analogous uh, set of edges, sorry, set of vertices, set of edges, our source and domain map. But notice we don't, in the definition of a graph, we don't have these two things here. We don't have the identities and we don't have the composition. And, that, and what that means in terms of maps, Is that we don't have these conditions. We don't, we're not, graphs are not required to respect these two conditions because, in general, graphs are not required to have loops and graphs are not required to have uh, a ver uh, a part, an edge for every part. That's what these things here are expressing. However, we can um, sort of use that to promote the graph into a category by adding these things in. And this promotion is another example of a universal morphism. In fact, what you would have, uh, and to answer, uh, Now's question, what you have is a, a link uh, between graphs and categories, a, uni a sort of a universal link called the, um, called the uh, free functor. Actually, I put this. And then there's an arrow here. It just says that for every Ah, okay. What it says is that there's a universal way of going from here uh, to a category. Well, actually, yeah, what you do is you go here first, and then you go back here. And so what we're doing is we're moving from, uh, remember I said that um, not every structure is a category. But in generally speaking, you can, the collection of such structures and their structure homomorphisms does form a category. But what we have on the left-hand side here is a category of graphs and graph homomorphisms. 
But what we have on the right-hand side is a category of, in fact, we have cat, a category of small category. So this is a kind of an instance of what now is talking. We have a universal way of promoting graphs to categories and then coming back again. Okay. And this is a universe. This is called the, the free forgetful adjoint situation. And that's it. <laughs> that's all I want to say. Yeah. Like a half get it. Half get it. <laughs> yeah, same. Okay, let's move on. And this is all, and this is all rather general. But as I mentioned earlier, one way to bootstrap your knowledge of understanding of category theory is to start with with um, simple categories, i.e., um, ordered sets. There are there are categories where at most there's only one arrow uh, between the objects, and so this situation, this sort of universal situation, is literally consists of the object that is closest to your target. And therefore, it must be unique because it, there is, if it exists, it must be unique because in these categories, you only have at most one uh, arrow. Uh, so it <clears throat> satisfies the uniqueness conditions, satisfied automatically. You only you also required to satisfy the existence condition, but in this case, it's pretty straightforward. So, so Steve, uh, about this, um, if I re uh, iterate the sort of definition into this particular example, it corresponds to something like a act, uh, one particular object 2.1 to functor uh, that goes from uh, integer to uh, real yep. in an uh, inclusion way. Yep. Uh, so that, that universal morphism co uh, consists of one particular object three yep. in this integer and mapping uh, or arrow in a real, which is uh, uh, equal or um, larger on this 2.1 to three here yep and that that corresponds to universal morphism that's right it's that that pair is the universal morphism and then you define this universalness uh through the relationship with all these uh, uh all possible numbers within this integer so it's a relational kind of a way to characterize yes that's right yeah and and that's the unique existence condition. Mm. It has to be satisfied for all the objects, Y in Z, all, all, in this context, all the numbers in Z and it's a conjunction here. So it's all the numbers and all the uh, arrows from the target to, that, to the image of that number. In this case, the image is just, there's no, it's just the same thing. So it's a pretty simple arrangement here. So in this case, it really reduces to the fact that you want Every number, well, actually, it's every it's every integer, it's not every real. You have to start from the left hand, the right hand side, uh, and it's the order relationship. So, in this simple situation, it, it really it re reduces the number of uh, conditions to just the condition of finding the uh, number that's less than sorry, finding the integer that's less than or equal to every other integer, but not smaller than the real that you're, that you're targeting. I see the finding the smallest integer, not less than x. Yeah, this one. And in fact, that's literally the definition. Ceiling of the real number is the smallest. Mm. This one, this number here. Reread that. Um, it's the smallest integer. Mm. Okay, which is which is this one here, three not less than x okay so satisfying this uh, relationship here okay. and so that's this, this concept of small really is encapsulated the formal notion of this informal notion of smallness is really encapsulated by this unique existence condition uh, again that's one of the reasons why i suggest uh, looking at uh, ordered sets like simmons book looking at ordered sets as a way to bootstrap your knowledge of of these things is that in the order test case it's quite simple okay okay let's move on to another example now oh okay now we're getting into the notion of, of uh, limits and compositionality the reason why 
I said there are many kinds of universal constructions. Uh, the reason why I'm focusing on limits is to get back to this uh, original point of contact between category theory and, and cognitive science is this notion of compositionality. And so uh, until now, when I, when I was talked about uh, compositionality, I really only talked about composition morphisms through the very basic model. Uh, maybe Steve, should we take a break? Yep. Okay. I'll yeah. let it up because this is the prelude to limits. <laughs> yeah. Do Do you want to give a preview of the next well, part? Uh, in one minute, the, or the only key point I want to mention here hmm. that where previously I talked about composition, the composition operation is always composition of arrows. The critical issue here is that we. When we talk about compositionality, more naturally we do so in cognitive science, we typically think of it in terms of composition of objects, like putting two objects A and B together. Mm -hmm. So that's, and limits give you both options. So it's a more general notion of compositionality. And we've already seen an example of this in some of the previous slides. For example, the product of two set, a product of two objects, A times B, is a, kind, is a, uh, a limit. And it's a form of compositionality and it's a form of universal morphism called a limit. That's all I want to say now. This point. That's, a, that's a motivation for introducing limits. Okay, then uh, we'll come back in four minutes. Okay.
basically. The mm. objects are a subset of the other category. Mm. But what if they're completely separate? Yeah, that, that's a good question. So, uh, Steve? Yep. So, uh, we were talking uh, whether we can actually think about, <laughs> let's say, you know, on the left side is a color category, color category for some normal people. On the right side is, a, let's say, colorblind people with, who has only gray, a shade of a gray. Yep. Then that can be kind of uh, included within the normal color space. That's right. And but then, no, that kind of universal morphism from uh, one particular color in the normal to functor of uh, color experience in the colorblind to normal color can be the closest gray within this you know, uh, color normal people or something like that. Is that? Yeah, that's a possibility, yeah. In general, we have the analogous concept of a subcategory. Yeah. A subset. So a subcategory has. Um, Basically, a subset of the objects and morphisms of a, of a larger category. But usually, there are some additional conditions there, but it, it, that's the basic idea. Not just any subset, but. So then, uh, now what, what Angus was wondering is that uh, whether this kind of thing uh, works, uh, even if it's not the subset. Um, yeah, so you don't. Uh, um, in the case of the, the limit, um, uh, what we'll see is you need uh, some notion of uh, index of a, of a category. So it's not, strictly speaking, a subset, but you are picking out a uh, uh, portion of, you know, sorry, it's not strictly speaking a subcategory, but you're picking out um, a subset of objects and, and arrows in a particular way, of a particular shape. And that's the basis of a, of a notion of a limit. Um, uh, so whether or not it answers your question will depend on a bit more specific details about. Uh, is it is it okay to consider it as an uh, uh, idea or essence rather than subcategory? Uh, are we talking about the universal morphism? Oh, oh uh, yeah, yeah. So the uh, the the universal morphism is sort of like the starting point or the ending point of a whole bunch of situations one way of thinking about it yeah uh, it, it also you can think of it as the essence because every other construction uh, factors through that uh, mediating arrow so you can think yeah, of it, it can be then uh, actual in the iit or something oh, yeah. all right uh, let, let's go ahead okay please um we're not going to get to the end within the next half hour because even though there's only 20 slides to go, uh, the slides tend to, <laughs> I, I flip through them and they get more dense as we go. So we'll see how far we get. Um, the point here is that uh, a limit, well, the concept of a limit actually uh, requires uh, a few uh, preliminary concepts. The basic idea is that it's the best way to pick out uh, sort of a collection of objects and arrows in some category. Uh, and it's also an instance of a, of a um, one way of thinking about a limit is a kind of like um, focus of attention. So you have your visual field as a, imagine as a kind of category. And then you have, you pick out a, a sort of a sub a part of that visual field. That's what we would call a cone. And the limit is sort of the best way of accessing that, that um, sort of part of the visual field. Uh, and the example here, uh, okay, I'll, I think I'll just go to the. Uh, okay. Now, to understand the limit, we really need to do several steps. Uh, and this is going to be tough because to understand the concept of a limit, you have to understand the concept of a shape category, then the concept of a diagram, and then the concept of a cone to a diagram, and the concept of a cone homo homo uh, homomorphism, and then a limit, uh, which is then the special case of the universal morphism. Uh, and this is going to take a lot of effort to understand this. So perhaps, okay, let's just do, see how we go. I've done, I've done it in about two slides. Normally you do this over a whole series of slides, but the, tr the pr trouble is that each individual concept is easy to, easy to follow, sure enough. But once you move to the next concept, you, forget, you tend to forget what the earlier concept was. But all concepts are intimately related. You need all of them at the same time to get a proper understanding. 
The basic idea here, let, let's look at the, the analogy of uh, focus of attention. Uh, the concept of the limit is a little bit more general than the previous examples. Like, uh, the previous examples of universal morphism really just focus on a particular object. But in general, we want, we want to combine objects and arrows as well. And to do that, we need to sort of pick out something uh, of, an, of a category. And we do that by, um, this is sort of analogous to what's called an indexed set. So you have a set and you want to pick out certain sub, uh, a subset or certain elements within that set. If you do it something analogously in category theory, you have a, a category called a shape category called J. It's usually, usually a small category, maybe one or two objects, maybe a couple of arrows as well. And that specifies the shape of the part of the category that you want to pick out. And here are some basic examples. Probably the, the simplest example is actually the empty shape. It just picks out nothing. But it's actually um, important. Now, in, in, in addition to that, the, what you're doing is you're picking out uh, a subcategory. And, and of course, when we're doing something, when we're relating categories, the only way to do that in category theory is via functor. So in this particular context, they're called, the special kinds of functors called diagrams. Uh, literally, we've been drawing diagrams. And in fact, those kinds of diagrams are a functor. A particular, they have a particular shape. The category J gives you the shape. And the functor is what it does is the diagram, what it does is pick out a part of the category, the target category C, a collection of objects and arrows of that particular shape. So a couple of examples. Probably the simple example, non simple example, which is probably easy, easy to apprehend than the empty one is uh, just a point. The shape of the category is just a category, the shape category J is just consists of a single object and therefore must have a single identity uh, arrow. And all it does is pick out a particular object and its identity arrow in the, cat, the target category C. So for example, in fact, we've already seen that similar to that in, in terms of the constant. Hey. Object X. Sorry, Steve, can I just ask a notation question that yep. you may have answered way back and I've spaced on? Um, when you've got the, uh, like the definition there, a diagram D of a shape J in a category C is a functor, D goes from J to C and the C is, uh, actually, I think I've answered my own question as I <laughs> talked through it. I, I'm <laughs> sorry. Um, I just, I'll explain. I got momentarily confused as to when it was mapping from J to C with that functor, what the like C stood for. But I realized as I was talking out loud that I remembered your explanation. Apologies. <laughs> no, no problem. But, but this is a common problem when trying to read the way that math, mathematicians um, express category theory is that they, they do these things without specifying. <laughs> and you're expected, because, it, because they say functor, they expect you to realize that, well, if it's a functor, then this must be the category. And this must be a category, even though it's notationally a little bit different. Notice that previously I've used bold case for categories, but here I've switched to this, this uh, slightly different notation. And usually they, they don't flag it, they expect you to follow it, but and like I've done here as well. But yeah, it, it's a good point. So um, sometimes there's a missing context in what's going on here. Uh, yeah. That's fine. Yeah, that's fine. I, as I J on CR copy. Yeah, I just, I got lost and then. Understood as I walked myself through it. Yeah. And so the, the, one of the, the example, the A cross B one that I'm going to introduce is actually comes from this uh, cate um, shape category. It just has two dot, uh, two objects. Now I, I give them dots because the names of the objects are not really important in this context. What's really important is what they're pointing to. Hence, hence the analogy to uh, an index. And so you often see something again. Here, here's where it starts to get confusing again. Uh, this. Uh, a, this pair, A, B, you normally think of this as like a pair of elements or, in, or a pair of sets, but actually, actually it's a functor. And it's a functor from this, these two nondescript uh, objects picking out the object A and the object B in this category C. Okay, and that's where, so that's why it gets confusing because sometimes you know, it's not clear whether they're, uh, whether they're really referring to it as an object or a functor or something else. And, and you need some sort of context to, <clears throat> you need to see the context. To see in this case, um, the fact that I've <clears throat> labeled with the arrow indicates that I'm treating the AB here as a pair in two ways as a functor and also as the often it's just the image of the functor that's, that's really critical, it's not, not the domain. And so that's why 
the, the, the mathematician will flip between the two expressions uh, using the same symbol, sometimes called yeah. a notation. I, I, I was also previously very confused by this thing. Um, so what, what it means here is basically anything in the category as a sort of the example of a so the realization of one particular idea or essence, essence of the point to one particular example of the point or essence of the pair to one particular example within category C. Yeah. And so that's considered as a sort of functor. Each example, the realization is a functor yeah. from idea to concrete example. Yeah. Make sense? No. Sorry. What's happening here is here is our shape category. It just has two objects. We don't really care what the objects are because we're not really interested in, in the origin. We're really only interested in, in the in what they're pointing to. In this case, they're pointing to these two objects, uh, A and B. And so we're, 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 the notation for A and B is doing double duty here. It's notating the pair of objects, A and B, but it's also notating the, uh, the specific functor. Because you could have another functor, for example. Another one could point to, in fact, if you had another functor, for example, and they both pointed to C, then you'd label that functor um, C as the pair CC. Uh, okay. So any example of the pair is this, you know, wow. Uh, Really, like you can put it as a P, B, C, or B, A, or C, C, and so on, right? Yeah. But everything that has a, a, a commonly, you know, contains this, you know, essence of two things yep. we, you know, see. Yeah, okay. And in this case, it's just a pair of objects. You can also do this for arrows as well. And a very simple case is where the shape category, instead of, in this case, the shape category consists of a single arrow, which means it has two objects. To and in this case, uh, the functor is not only picking out two objects, but it's also picking out the... In fact, this shape category is also picking out uh, two... Uh, has to pick out two uh, morphisms as well, but they're the trivial ones, the, the identities. And that's what this one here is doing. And so in general, we say that this, uh, these collections of functors form a functor category. That's the collection of all functors from this common J category, shape category J into uh, this common uh, uh, category C. And in, this, we are, in previous talk, uh, yesterday's talk, I talked about the category of arrows. Well, in fact, the category of arrows is just a functor category where the shape category is just a, a single arrow like this one here. So there's a lot going on here. Uh, and um, what I really need to say is talk about the uh, another general situation called the diagonal functor, which takes every object into uh, to a particular functor. So here, here again, here where here is another example where we're spanning different levels of analysis. The um, uh, this example here, the diagonal functor is a very general functor, and what it does is it takes objects and arrows and sends them to themselves functors, takes the objects to functors, and therefore the arrows must go to natural transformation. So we're really Stepping up a gear here, uh, and here's an example. For example, if I take the this particular diagonal functor, which takes the objects into this particular functor category, what it's doing is it's taking the object A to this identity morphism. So now we're really sort of going up a gear, and we're talking about not only previously we just talked about the very simple case where the objects go to objects, arrows go to arrows. Now we're talking about objects going to arrows. Uh, and arrows going to natural trans. In this particular case, objects going to functors and arrows going to natural transformation. Um, and so, okay, that's the first two concepts. We, so I, I mentioned before, to get that the concept of a limit, uh, we need concept of shape category, concept of diagram, and a concept of a cone. And this, uh, and that's what this slide is expressing here. Now, Notice that a diagram is a functor. Now, a cone, as, as suggestive, has a vertex and a base. The base is the diagram. So 
Now you can look at it, see if it, here is an example of a cone. Here, the vertex is V. The base is your, all your bits and pieces that you picked out, like A and B, for example. And the cone is just this business here. Go down here. And you can think of this as like a focus of attention. So I think of this, you're focusing on this sort of part of this you know, very general field of view. You're just focusing on this spotlight of attention here, for example. Maybe that's your, your eye. <laughs> and formally, this is called a cone. And then, and then very quickly, the limit then is what's called the universal cone. Now, how to get from here to here actually is quite a few steps. And I don't want to go through all of them because it'll take a lot of time. But the idea is that you can have many cones, just like you can have many diagrams. Here is another cone. Maybe you should change the color. Here is another cone to the same base. The critical point is that they all have the same base. So that's why we say it's a cone to a diagram D. Now remember, previously I said one of the things about category theory is we can flip between these two levels, but we can hide some of this information. Now we can treat this entire um, notion of, uh, of diagram, instead of looking at the individual components of the diagram here, we said that the, the diagram is just a factor, so we can sort of chunk all this and regard this as just a single object now. And this object is itself is a functor. And so we're really chunking all this information. And the reason why we want to do that is because the limit is just this universal cone. Once we do that, then our, uh, our cone becomes an arrow. So here is our, and we saw this uh, in last yesterday's talk where what we did is we sort of chunked a whole bunch of arrows into a single arrow or the structure. Well, this is another kind of structure. It's a cone, has a cone structure. And it's a universal arrow because all other cones, we, we chunked all this, these other cones as well. We chunk this blue cone. Uh, sorry, I should have, um, I shouldn't have dropped it in green. Oh, Here's another cone. And the critical thing is that all these cones factor through this, you know, this universal cone. So to get to this diagram, we have to get through here. So this, that's for this reason, we call it a universal cone. And again, it's a universal morphism in the sense that it, it consists of a pair, universal uh, the limit, universal object, and mediating, mediating a pair here. So we say the limit to a diagram D is a universal morphism from it. Now, it, it gets a bit confusing what this diagonal functor is doing, but... Um, that's what the diagonal function is. But what, what, what you really need is an example, actually. Um, probably there are too many, there are actually too many details, but an example here illustrates this point. Now, the simple product of two uh, objects, for example, the product of two sets, which is the Cartesian product, uh, is an example of a, of a limit okay, and a universal cone. So normally we what we would do, we would, we would say um, an ob uh, the product of two objects A and B, so two sets, say it's a set of all pairs, is now normally, again, what gets confusing is when people talk about the, the Cartesian product of the product of two sets, they really just focus on this part here, but in reality, it's, it's two parts. It's the, it's the product set plus the two morphisms, which are, are projections in this context, that retrieve the, the original things, A and B. Okay? And that's, a, that's encapsulated in this notion here of a universal cone. And so it's the, the product as a, as a limit is really this thing here plus this thing here. The beauty of all this is this, this all gets reorganized in the notion of universal morphism. Uh, now, the, the critical thing is that this is the, the, the general definition. Now, it has to be specified or made specific by setting the particular category. So for example, in the category of sets and functions, uh, the, the limit of two or the product of two uh, sets is just their Cartesian product, i.e. all 
pairwise combinations of the elements from the two sets and the two projections. You know, the projections which just retrie retrieves the, the first and the second element. And that all comes together uh, in this general situation. However, if we were to move to the sort of restricted category, the category of sets and inclusions, then the product of two sets is simply their intersection, i.e. Uh, a times B. So in the general formula, it's a specific analog, A times B in the general form is um, intersection. Now this has a, I mentioned briefly yesterday, this has an analog to logic. Uh, this looks very similar to conjunction. And in fact, it is. If I were to say A and B implies uh, B, for example. Well, this implication symbol is not by accident. It alludes to the fact that th this thing here is a natural transformation, as is this inclusion is a natural transformation, uh, as, is, uh, as are these projections. The reason for that is, is because, well, re recall that I said that in, in this perspective here, they look A and B just like, like objects, but in fact, A and B are act actually uh, functors. And in fact, this is also a functor. In fact, all these objects are in the functor category, and therefore all these arrows must be natural transformations. So the projections themselves are natural transformations. We alluded to this fact uh, yesterday when we talked about the um, uh, projection as a natural transformation. And in fact, it also has an analog, a formal analog into logic. A and B, if A and B are true, that implies that B must be true, or likewise. And in fact, this is analogous to, and that's, that's the reason, for example, why your, your Venn diagrams are so natural way of thinking about logic. It's just for this reason, Venn diagrams, that we have a set A and a set B, and then, if we have the entire, uh, if we have uh, A and B, then we must, if we have a point that's in A and B, then we must have a point that's in A or in B. And that's the reason for that. It's the reason why often, if you're thinking about logic, draw a Venn diagram and give you a good aims because there is a formal analog in these situations. Okay. Um, there's a lot that can be said here. Uh, and. And Maybe Steve. So yep. just to kind of link uh, link back to what we've been talking. Uh, so uh, here, just to make sure. So the product uh, is one of the universal constructions, right? Yep. So that that means that uh, it is. Uh, uh, but but in this case, um, it's the dual form. So it's a bit complicated. Um, mentally to flip it, but uh, it's a map uh, morphism from this one into a pair of uh, things, uh, this arrow and also you know, the, it, it is a uh, morphism from object to functor. Yeah, so in this particular case, uh, it's the dual form. And so I'll just draw it. Maybe if you use a colimit as an example, it's easy, easier possibly because it's the same form. Let's see if I've got the example. The yeah, yeah, yeah. So we reverse all the arrows, and then we see that the the co-product is actually goes from A to B into that situation. So, and what's not shown here is the diagonal functor. So this is a functor. The functor is going from here to here. Yeah. And it's the diagonal functor. Now, in this case, the diagonal functor is very simple. It's just repeating, it's just a double 
doubling so this this thing here is actually a it's just a pair of a plus b and the reason for that is because on the on the left hand side the category is a category of pairs mm. That's, but and notationally we just it's easier just to And so you've got these two arrows. So you've got A being injected into A plus B. Mm. And you've also got B. Uh, so this one is a typo, probably B to A, A to B. Ah, yes, sorry, that's a typo. Very good. Mm. And you've got the, this one being injected into here. Normally, you would, see that you, you would see this as written like this. It's a diagram splitting this, separating all these bits and pieces. As mm. Here, and then you have a B on this side. Mm. Going here. Mm. But from this perspective, and then you'd have you know, your arbitrary uh, the here, all it, and all it's saying is that any any map from a a b to this vertex p must go through its coproduct. So that's why the coproduct is the universal object in this situation. Right. So that's the, so universal mapping here is from here to functor, mm -hmm. this diagonal functor, and the uh, thing is uh, it's a pair of this object with this arrow. Uh, which satisfies this condition. Yeah, this object actually, and this arrow. Uh, this one, yeah, sorry, sorry. That's right. Now, normally, you, when you, if you were to uh, open an introductory textbook to category theory, they'd probably give you this example first, not the way I've done it. However, this example doesn't make it clear what's the length of the universal morphism and how, how all these concepts uh, unify. So that's why I've gone, gone this other route. However, going this other route, particularly for limits, is uh, takes a quite a quite a few steps. So there's a kind of trade-off, as you can expect. You isolate some information, you want to highlight it, but at the expense of hiding other information. Maybe difficult for your understanding. I'm probably going to come up to probably going over time, and I've still got a lot of slides to go through, but I, I won't go through them more. Perhaps the thing I want to say most, uh, okay, the thing I want to say is how, getting back to the link. Actually, I want to say my, the whole point of doing universal constructions was to address uh, the systematicity productivity issues in, in cognitive science. Uh, it'll take an entire um, tutorial just to explain the systematicity point, um, but basically it's the notion of that, you know, uh, <clears throat> that there's a common structure. And that's the reason why we have these classes of Abilities and the universal morphism captures this common structure. Uh, but, uh, and there's more to it in the story than this, but perhaps I just want to finish by saying how this, getting back to the point of how to make, how to, we made this conceptual leap between uh, natural transformation and universal morphism, and how are these two things connected? And as we noted, you know, there's uh, this sort of disconnect where the universal morphism is from an object to a function that seems rather strange. Well, we can sort of rectify that or, or patch up this distinction by introducing this notion of a comma category. It's also important to know why the universal morphism is so addresses this notion of ad hoc, because the universal morphism is sort of the best you can, you can do. But unfortunately, to introduce the notion of a comma category, we've got to generalize the notion of, of this relationship between functors and so forth. Uh, <clears throat> this, uh, again, we get back to this notion of um, commuting square, which we saw with uh, uh, natural transformation, but the, the key difference here is that with a comma category, we have these, the two functors S and T uh, don't have to be from the same codomain category. So you notice that they, have, they share the same, sorry, they share the same codomain category C, but they, they have uh, different uh, domain categories where in the natural transformation. So they come from different perspectives actually. So there's S and there's T. The and the critical thing is that it's not just, it, it's only the, the objects are, this triple. 
actually it's, it's the objects from the original category, the A and B on the other side. And it's the morphism, this morphism here. That's an object. Uh, like we have another object down here, not triple, here and here actually. The critical thing is that the, the arrows are these pairs of, are these pairs of arrows in here. Again, this, this takes quite a bit of um, mental uh, gymnastics to follow this, but it's, it's the pair of arrows, but it's not just any pair of arrows, it's the pair of arrows that makes this square commute. Okay. And this is where this is a connection to natural transformation. Okay. Now in the natural transformation, the perspective is, is, is this link from left to right, and it's just one particular square, uh, in, one for each such situation. In the universal, in the common category case, it's, the, it's from top to bottom. So the arrows go from top to bottom, and it's all possible squares that are available in this scenario. And that's why the common category is sort of a generalization. And the critical issue, how it links to universal morphism, is that the universal morphism from X to F is the initial object X, or, in this bit, or it's the final object, uh, where X now is treated as a functor. And here, it sort of rectifies this sort of conceptual disconnect. So previously we said uh, X was an object. Well, in this context, X is treated as a constant functor. So, it, and so you can see the link where you've got two functors where these squares look like natural transformations. In fact, it's all such possible squares in this scenario. And to, and to make, the, make this even more concrete or tie this back even further, slide here. Uh, I'll skip that. Oh, no, I won't. Sorry. Oh, okay. And so it's in the, in the con context of comma categories, the, the product is actually the, what's called the final object or the terminal object in this scenario. And the terminal object means that in all such situations, all, all the other possible squares, all, sorry, all the other possible objects factor or point to or end up uh, at, the, at, the, um, at the universal movies. And the way to think about this for initial and terminal objects, hence universal construction generally, uh, all roads lead to, lead, lead to Rome. In other words, every, every such universal morphism uh, can be re-expressed this way as either initial or terminal objects. And that's, and that's how we get back to this relationship between morphism and object. Um, that's probably, okay, and then that's the, that's the link. And that's why when I introduced um, those symbols, those funny symbols, I said the natural transformation looks like a square an arrow with an arrow in it. And so the natural transformation is focusing on the sliding the left-hand vertical edge across to the right-hand vertical edge in a, in a coherent way. Well, the universal morphism is doing something sort of similar, but you're sliding the top, the top edge. And remember, these are squares actually. It's just that this one is this, this one is a, this thing here is just the repeat. Uh, sliding it down and so and and the universal morphism is the end object or the initial object, depending on which way you do. Okay. Um, that's I think I'll just wrap, uh, I'll just brisk, briskly go through the rest of the slides, flash through them so, so we can finish. Uh, and the motivation for that is that was the systematicity and productivity uh, issues in cognitive science and how they can be addressed. Uh, I wanted to talk about um, recursion and co-recursion, but you know, it'll take me a while to get through this. Uh, the critical one critical thing, and probably of interest here, why would you want to do? Okay, we've had the concept of recursion. Why would you want to do co-recursion? Uh, co-recursion goes in the other direction, and the critical one of the critical issues is, and why this is probably relevant to cognitive science, is that um, in co-recursion you don't have to go to the end to for it to be useful. One of the limit limitations of of recursion is that to get to the to do any computation, you really have to. Uh, sorry, Mr. In recursion, uh, to actually compute anything, you have to go all the way to the end. So it's only really useful for uh, finite structures. You have to go all the way to the terminal condition uh, before you can finish. Whereas in co-recursion, uh, you don't have to do that. If you have a concept of, of lazy, what's called a lazy evaluation, concept introduced from computer science, uh, you, can, you can do what's called uh, process, process streams or infinite lists. Uh, which is sort of a natural way to think about cognition. Uh, and the reason you can do that is because you, you, 
you're going in the opposite direction. You don't have to. Do I have an example? No, I have an example. Oh, no. Specific example. But the, re the reason, the simple reason, the, the general reason is that um, with lazy evaluation, you can actually short circuit this thing and can do this computation first. Okay, and then later, and leave this to, to uh, progress as you like. Okay. As, it, as would happen if you have an infinite stream. So it's what you're doing. You can process this and then this and then this and this. And just let it run. Uh, there's a paper on this by Rutten called um, Code Recursion as a sort of generalized state machine. So you can think of uh, a cognitive system as like a generalized state machine. Generalized in the sense that, you know, you can do quite a, a lot of, these areas can be quite complex in their own right. And that, and it, that is one of the reasons why I often think about co recursion, a kind of generalized iteration. Uh, you can do that. Uh, this is the last slide. Uh, I want to introduce the idea here is that you can think of cognition as in terms of universal constructions. And this is the idea of the, of the universal mapping principle. You know, why? Often the compositionality principle, you know, is well known in cognitive science, but it's, it's a methodological principle. It's something that you do for get, to get things done. But what category theory says is that well, there is a reason why there is a reason why that um, things may be composed this way, and it's because it's the best possible construction that, in, the, in the generalized concept. So we can think of cognition as the kind of best possible way of doing things, why it's systematic and so forth, and development as a sort of realization of that uh, universal, those universal constructions. Uh, there's a lot more to be said, of course, and as, as uh, you already discussed, this kind of material would take an entire semester to cover in any sort of you know, depth. But what I try to do is sort of give you an overview. Uh, there are many introductions to category theory. We've already talked about a couple. Um, Spivak is a, and Ongham Spivak is another example. Uh, if you're interested in the philosophy of this, uh, uh, these two articles, these two books here are quite interesting. If you have a sort of a strong uh, Functional programming background, and I really recommend uh, Bird's Bird and Moore or Walters. Or Walters in the, for the general context of computer science, but uh, specifically Bird and Moore. Particularly this notion of recursion and co recursion is done in quite a bit of depth there. It's been expanded by others as well. Uh, if, you want, if you're more mathematically oriented, then Linster is, is, is a good place to start. Um, McLean is the general reference, so called Bible of category theory, but it's really you really need a lot of maths background to, to appreciate it. So I don't, unless you have done you know, a maths degree, I wouldn't really recommend it. But this is uh, for applications, yes. Uh, and, and that's about it. Okay. Um, I think that's it. Uh, yeah, thank yeah. you. That's all I want to say at this stage. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Okay. All right. Uh, is there any question or comments? Uh, Yota, do you have anything? Or Ross? Uh, no. Yep. No, I'm fine. Thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. You're welcome. <laughs> anything, you guys? Fine. I just need to go to the <laughs> slides <laughs> again. I don't have a specific question now. Yeah, I, I guess, uh, yeah, probably. After after going back to uh, particular kind of examples, especially relevant to what, what we are doing in terms of uh, you know uh, core structure research, I feel like a particular example of the let's say experience to Baba report type functor or uh, experience to similarity report kind of functor can have a interesting kind of, you know, uh, correspondence with what you are talking towards the end, like a uh, universal mapping and also uh, limit and things like that. Yep. I think and, so. But I, I think I, I, I have a much better kind of view uh, right now than before uh, about this universal mapping. So I, I'll probably come, come up uh, some diagram to you and then mm -hmm. run whether this is the right way to go. Yep. There, yeah, there, the category theory is vast, so it, it, yeah, uh, 
there are many ways to sort of interpret it and, and use it. Yeah. And one of the one of the issues of level that kept cropping up yesterday and today, you can a lot of these things you can think of as a kind of attention, but normally attention is sort of thought of as a way of separating signal and noise. But in the category theory approach, it's really a way of you know, there are many sorts of structural relationships in, in particular the domain of interest. And category theory sort of allows you to focus on certain aspect of that while hiding other aspects, but it doesn't hide it in the sense that that, 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 that structural information disappears altogether. It's still there, but it's just um, taken out of your focus of attention temporarily, and then you can bring it back in again in a coherent way. It's like a functional programming. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and often the problem with category theory, you know, is that there, there are quite a few mountains to climb to get to the um, sort of the interesting bits that may be relevant. You know, and this point's been made by even by category theorists. You know, some of the, the, the examples that you need, the simple examples like I introduced, like the product and set, seem to be too simple for applications. But you need to go through these sort of simple examples to get sort of a, an, an intuition of how to build up the more complicated example. And that's why I think many people are turned off because. It's not clear what the advantages are. They're kind of a catch-22 situation. You, know, you can't see where, where you want to go um, until you've climbed you know, several mountains. <laughs> but, you're not, it's not, it's not, but those mountains themselves block the view. <laughs> it's not really clear whether the, whether the climb is worth it. But in my experience, it is. It's definitely worth it. But, and I think category theory is a will be a necessary component of, of polymer science. They're not, they're not sufficient in its own right. But that's the sort of sort of catch twenty two situation you get into. You can't really see its value until you put in the effort in the first place, and it's not really clear where the, where, the, where the payoff will be. But I, I believe it, it, it's there. Well, another way of thinking about um, the motivation for category theory is that if you can think of uh, cognitive system as a kind of system of systems, a kind of meta system, a familiar way of thinking about cognition, of course. Well, category theory itself, let's not forget it, is a, is a meta theory as it was originally proposed. You know, it's kind of a, a branch of meta mathematics. So, in that sense, you know, category theory is sort of a natural home for their thinking about cognition in terms of systems of systems. Okay. Uh, nothing else? That's it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, Good luck with your uh, tutorial. Before you all go, uh, yeah, ask one question to everyone. Because I'm going to give this something more or less this tutorial next week at the COGSI, did you feel that level was appropriate? Too high, too too low, too fast, too too um, slow? Uh, who's the target audience at the uh, COGSI? The so like like general cognitive neuroscientists, people with a computational or maths background. Like what sort of? It's hard to say. Know? 180 people signed up for the tutorial. It could be a wide variety of people. Uh, and how long is it the same length, like three hours? Uh, it's a whole day. Um, four of us will be giving the tutorial. Um, in my case, it'll be two, one hour, about one hour, two one hour parts. So, but is it the same material that you just had in two hours or is it the material over the whole day? Um, my part will be based on the material that I just gave for two days. Yeah. So primarily the first part, I guess, but some of the second part. I, I, yeah, I think some of them are going to struggle. I think yeah. it might be a bit fast. For... Yeah. The, the, part, the parts I found easiest to understand were when you're like really taking your time, like circling things and really slowly going through every like aspect of each of your figures. And then the, the later parts when we start running out of time and you have to like brush over things and like assume that we now understood this concept and you don't need to explain it again. That's that's when it started to get pretty difficult. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thanks to now for that suggestion, actually use, using the arrow, <laughs> using draw. I, originally I hadn't thought about doing that, but I, yeah, it helped me actually slow down the, the talk by actually drawing the arrows. So maybe I'll do that as well. Yeah, I, I found that, you know, uh, when, when I, Talk with you on those uh, Hayato, uh, in, you know, on Zoom or in person. Now, uh, what's most useful uh, 
is uh, when you draw the diagram in particular order. Right. When the diagram is there from the beginning, it's very difficult to know how this comes about, right? Yeah. I find that helpful too. Yeah, but you know, when you talk about, uh, uh, for example, universal morphism, starting from this object X to factor from this category B to A, uh, A, A to B is actually the object here mm -hmm. and also uh, an object here and also morphism here. That that kind of order of the you know drawing makes more sense. I mean, uh, yep. it's easier to understand. Okay. Yeah, so may, maybe it's worth actually spending some you know money to buy that drawing tool to make it you know um yeah more smooth possibly. Mouse is very difficult to draw, right? Yeah. <laughs> the Wacom tablets are pretty cheap. Yeah. Yeah. I think I'll do. The it. other the other thing I'd say is. I think I understood the best as well when it, the material was closest to analogies, either from uh, cognitive science or like relatively common ones from computer science that most people would know. And like, yeah. obviously the whole point of category theory is you want to have like a meta theory of mathematics. So you can't always stay right next to the analogies, but yeah. the closer it is, I think the easier a time people will have. Okay. Or at least bringing it back relatively frequently to like, Grounded to a certain degree, I think helps. Yeah, the the key, the example of the uh, pre-order of a real number and integer is uh, really clear. That's a definitely advantage, but also relevance to the uh, cognitive scientists are less clear, right? Yeah. So that's the difficult thing. So I I thought that you know maybe you know our kind of uh, paper using the level of consciousness or you know color mm -hmm. even if, if it's you know imprecise it may be more interesting to those people mm -hmm. oh. is there anything else you guys yeah that's pretty much uh feedback from us good luck for your tutorial oh thank you yeah, yeah, thanks for the Thanks for sticking it out for two days. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Thanks for sharing it to us.